Hello, everybody. It's Joe Pernesti, and welcome to uh, another edition of our building construction uh, webinar on fire engineering. Uh, we received some uh, very positive feedback on our first two, so we, we thank you uh, for, for watching, and uh, we hope to keep delivering um, quality uh, information uh, to you on building construction. Today, uh, we are going to discuss probably in my opinion, a, a truly a forgotten event that many uh, firefighters just don't know anything about. And we're coming up on the 30th anniversary of it. And that is the One Meridian Plaza fire, uh, which took the lives of three firefighters in Philadelphia. Uh, the fire occurred on February 22nd, 1991. And um, at the time, you know, it was pre-internet, and uh, it made the news. And uh, over time, it's just kind of uh, been forgotten. So we thought that uh, we would discuss uh, some of the building construction uh, features of the building and what actually took place that caused uh, the fire to grow out of control. And uh, so we have brought in a gentleman who has, uh, that wrote the after action report or co-authored the after action report uh, Mr. Charles Jennings uh, as our guest today, and um, he is going to take us through this fire on the, as it occurred, and we'll talk about the fire, talk about some of the tactics and the, and the lessons learned that uh, can be applied today. So um, if you have high rises, this is one you want to tune in for, and if you don't, it's still important to understand the, the, the history and to understand some of the building construction features. Um, that you may have in your town, whether you respond mutual aid or on a smaller scale. So um, before we get to Charles, we'll introduce our panel again. It's just old faces, but uh, the best faces I feel that uh, I'm honored to be a part of in the fire service. And we'll start off with uh, Paul Dansback. Paul, if you would introduce yourself to our uh, listeners and viewers. Sure, Chief, thank you. Uh, Paul Dansback, I'm the fire marshal in Rutherford, New Jersey. Uh, I've been in that position since 1986. Uh, started in the fire service as a volunteer in the Rutherford Fire Department in 1977. I did 10 years as a chief officer in that system. Uh, I remain a, uh, a member of the volunteer fire department. I'm also a fire instructor up at Bergen County Fire Academy uh, for quite a number of years and a presenter out at FDIC. And uh, I am truly grateful for being uh, allowed to be part of, of this panel and, and this group. Thanks. James Johnson, welcome again back. Awesome. Yeah, so I'm James Johnson. I'm a firefighter up in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Uh, started out in the fire service in 2003, and I've uh, worked for Vancouver for the past 10 years. Um, just an all-around building construction geek, and <clears throat> I also really love all the high-rise stuff, um, especially standpipes and, and that. So this is, uh, this is a fire that I've uh, read lots about over the years and really excited to to be digging into it today. So, and honored to be involved with this group as always. Thanks again for, for being here. Jack Murphy. Hi, it's Jack Murphy, a uh, fire marshal retired, former deputy chief, currently serve as the New York City High Rise Fire Safety Directors Association Chairman. We're in all high rise office and hotel buildings. And like uh, Glenn and Charles, uh, currently uh, an adjunct at John Jay College. All right. Glenn. Sorry about that. Yeah, the phone's going off here. My wife works from home like everybody else. So uh, Glenn Corbett, um, uh, as, as uh, Jack mentioned, uh, Charles, uh, the three of us um, are involved with John Jay College. Uh, it's my, my W-2 along with Charles. Uh, he and I have been there a long time now um, teaching uh, both emergency management and fire science. Um, technical editor of Fire Engineering Magazine, um, co-author of Brannigan's Building Construction for the Fire Service. And uh, like Paul, a fireman in Bergen County for, for a long time. So uh, this, is, uh, this is something good. So thank you, Joe. Thanks. And Charles Jennings. Charles is our special guest. Again, thank you for doing this. We appreciate it. If you would, um, tell us a little bit about yourself, sir. Sure. Well, first of all, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and an honor. Uh, I have fire engineering and this esteemed panel. Uh, and it's good to see uh, uh, the young people 
uh, coming up. So we see the present and the future all on one big screen here. Uh, so uh, as, as with Glenn, I'm a full-time faculty member at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Uh, also a proud alum of that program. I went through the master's in fire protection management program back in the uh, mid eighties. Uh, I started out as a volunteer in upstate New York, West Elmira, New York, uh, a, a district that had no, zero high rises uh, in uh, 1979 as a junior and, uh, and, and kind of culminated my fire service career as deputy commissioner of public safety uh, for the city of White Plains, New York, where we were over police fire contract DMS and uh, part of that time, I served as acting fire chief. Uh, also did a stint as, uh, on the board of fire commissioners for the city of Ithaca, New York, while I was doing my PhD in city planning at Cornell. And then I also do a little consulting work uh, on the side. Uh, and I did this report, uh, and I want to acknowledge my co-authors before I forget. Jay Gordon Routley is currently uh, with the Montreal Fire Department and uh, Mark Chubb. Uh, uh, it was a former fire chief up in uh, Skyway Fire District outside of Seattle, uh, now working for a code consulting group. Um, and so this report was done while I was an employee of TriData, uh, who were, uh, is a, was a fire protection contractor and did this uh, under contract for the U.S. Fire Administration. So again, welcome, and we'll get right into it. And uh, Charles, take us back to that that night in February, uh, Bob, tell us a little bit about the building and where it was situated and, and uh, take us through what uh, took place. Okay, uh, so what you have here, and I think, are you seeing, seeing the, uh, the diagram now? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this building, One Meridian Plaza, uh, no longer stands. Uh, this building was demolished following the fire and uh, we can talk a little bit about that at the end of the talk, but this was a huge disruption. This building was literally on City Hall Plaza in Philadelphia. And if you know, you've seen the Rocky movies or, or uh, uh, was it the movie Philadelphia, you know, the big statue of William Penn. And so this was a premier building right across from City Hall. And um, uh, it was what we would call class A office space. So this was really a nice building high-end clients. It was all law firms, uh, I think, and securities people, and uh, uh, a cable company. Uh, and, and that gets of interest because the building itself um, was constructed, as, as many were at the time, without sprinklers. Uh, however, over the years, uh, some of the tenants, uh, in particular the cable company, whose name I'm totally blanking on, I think it's in the report, um, had a corporate policy that they sprinklered their office space. And so, um, uh, which, which ends up, they occupied the 30th floor uh, up. I'm not sure they had all the way to the top of the building, but essentially you have this office building uh, with the normal fire protection features, they had a stand pipe system, backup generator, um, and kind of the unthinkable happened was that uh, in the night, a weeknight, uh, they had a fire. And the first report of this fire, which I think is, is noteworthy and also tells you that you're going to be having a bad night, is that the first report of a fire came from someone outside the building. A passerby saw flames on the upper stories and called the fire department. And so, again, we're talking the Philadelphia Fire Department here, no strangers to putting out fires. Uh, and really one of the few, you know, major metro, unlimited resources, tremendously experienced. And every single... Um, card that they drew was a bad card that night. Um, and so there were a host of issues uh, that they encountered. Uh, first of which is that uh, the fire itself, the, the building staff, and this is, is a repeat of what had happened in the first interstate fire back in 1988 in, in Los Angeles. But rather than call the fire department, the uh, building staff uh, sent a maintenance person up in the elevator to investigate. Um, they Elevator opens on the fire floor. Lo and behold, gee, there's a fire, we're in trouble. Fortunately, the, the security person was able to recall the elevator and get them back down. Um, the fire department, when they arrive, uh, their first crews going up in the elevator, as I recall, the power went out and they lost power through the rest of that fire. So they started off with their initial crews getting trapped in an elevator, all the power out. And, um, and this fire basically, uh, ended up extending from the uh, 20, 22nd up to the 30th floor 
Um, there was some drop down through convenience stairs from the 22nd to the 21st floor. Um, and, uh, and so this uh, prior to 9-11 was, uh, and, and, and later, I guess, some of these facade fires, uh, but this was the, the largest number of floors uh, exposed to fire in a high rise building in the United States um, and exceeded that of uh, uh, the first interstate fire in, in Los Angeles. So uh, let me take a, a pause and, and pass it on to uh, Glenn or Jack who may want to fill in some more details on this. Okay, thanks, Charles. Um, yeah, so uh, I think, you know, one of the major issues here was that this um, building, uh, of course, as, as uh, Charles mentioned, did not have sprinklers in it when it was built. Um, it was only after the building was constructed that uh, sprinklers were retrofitted into the building. Um, that's not unlike, for example, the World Trade Center. A lot of people don't know that the World Trade Center um, in fact, the Twin Towers were built without sprinklers. And because the insurance industry, uh, the, the uh, Port Authority of New York and New Jersey owned the Twin Towers required, uh, were forced to put them in. So this wasn't uncommon back then to have very large high rises without sprinklers. I and mean, it's kind of remarkable if we think about it today. Um, so, you know, again, we have to treat this as an unsprinkled fire. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later, Charles, I think of some photos, we can see the actual damage that was done. Uh, there, um, of course, uh, and Jack can, and, and uh, James can certainly, and Paul can jump on this as well. One of the major issues to evolve out of this fire uh, was the, um, the issue of the stamp pipe system in the building, because effectively that was the only uh, suppression equipment that was available to the firefighters. Um, it's a very long story, but the bottom line is this. Uh, if the fire department uh, went to attack the fire, on the fire floor with inch and three quarter hose and back then 100 PSI uh, automatic nozzles. Um, and when they basically went to mount the attack and opened up the uh, hose valve on the floor, uh, they effectively got virtually no water out of it. I, off the top of my head, it was just over 20 some odd PSI coming out of the, out of the hose valve. What it all boiled down to was the fact that the uh, building standpipe system was using uh, pressure regulating hose valves, uh, valves that are intentionally designed to limit the pressure, specifically over high pressure, um, particularly on lower floors of a high rise building um, that would put firefighters in danger. So the intent of a pressure uh, uh, reducing hose valve actually is to, again, to cut the pressure down on the lower floors of the building where the pressures are the highest so they can uh, properly and safely operate a hose line. The problem here was the valve that was installed on the, uh, the floor that they attached to, of course, as I mentioned earlier, uh, was effectively um, down to in the 20, low 20 PSI range, which was meaningless. It was essentially useless. The fire department spent quite a bit of time trying to figure out what was going on. Um, they increased the pressure in the street, tried every conceivable kind of thing, and of course, as all this is going on, the, uh, the uh, fire is getting larger and larger, and uh, they're not able to put in, again, put any water on the fire. So we'll come back, we'll circle back. I know we got a lot of comments about that, uh, about the system, but it, it was a central issue in this fire. Um, another one um, that I think we should probably talk about is the structural integrity of the building. Um, this was, a tr again, a, a traditional uh, high-rise building, steel frame with spray-on fireproofing. Um, and lo and behold, uh, this fire, a multi-floor fire, really did uh, test that system out. Um, and I believe Charles may have a photo later on of some of the structural damage uh, done to the building. Uh, it was incredible. I, I mean, to, th to look at the distortion of the steel beams, particularly um, in this uh, structural system is, is just incredible. And uh, this is one of the reasons why as the fire effectively got out of hand um, and basically was uncontrollable that the fire department pulled uh, their members out of the building because they anticipated structural collapse of this high rise. Right, and Glenn, uh, yeah. if I could just jump in on that note, um, that, that uh, you know, the structural damage to the building was really unprecedented uh, and for a high rise building. But the, the fire department, the Philadelphia fire department, um, fought this fire aggressively 
uh, and they actually uh, made a decision to manually lay five inch line up the stairwell in order to establish a water supply, okay? Uh, and so we're going up to the 22nd floor, right? So imagine hearing that order on the radio. Uh, in addition, what we don't wanna forget uh, is that there were uh, three firefighter fatalities in this incident. Uh, there was an engine company that was sent up above the fire in the early stages to ventilate um, via uh, the central stairwell uh, of that building. They were several floors above the fire, but they got disoriented in, in heavy smoke. Um, and by the time they gave a distress call, um, they were disoriented and actually gave a call indicating they were on a different floor, two floors below, uh, actually two floors above where they actually were. And uh, their last transmission was a request to the incident commander to break a window. Uh, and so the, the discipline that they showed, um, and, and they actually were located with the assistance of uh, a medevac helicopter um, who was, I don't wanna put too fine a point on it, but they were, you know, there was not a rigorous protocol in place for use of helicopters at high rise fires in Philadelphia. They were flying around the building with their spotlight and saw the broken window and that enabled the rescue crews to find out where those members were. So, so just to, to tick some of these off of uh, all the things that went wrong. So the uh, fire, we started out okay in terms of the building. Uh, a smoke detector on the 22nd floor did activate. As we said before, the building employees didn't call the fire department. Their procedure, and I'll show you a photograph of this, uh, was basically to reset the alarm uh, if it didn't reset, go and investigate, uh, which is exactly what they did. The alarm company waited for the building to verify before they transmitted the alarm to the fire department. And in fact, by the time they never got that call to the fire department, it came from passerby. Um, the electrical systems for the building, the primary and secondary electrical riser were both compromised by the fire. They were side by side in an inadequately protected uh, um, chase. Uh, fire fireproofing, fire stopping, fire barriers, as you would expect for an existing building or as you should expect for an existing building, were in various states of you know, uh, inadequacy. And so there were penetrations of the fire. The pressure reducing valves, as Glenn indicated, uh, stairwell doors were locked from the stairway side to prevent re-entry. Um, the fire department, there was no, uh, because they lost power, there was no way to unlock those. And so every single stairway door from the stairway to the uh, fire floors, I uh, had to be forced. Um, uh, Pre-fire plans were fairly minimal. Um, and, uh, and the principal mode of fire spread was via the outside of the building, um, you know, uh, through auto exposure. And so the windows would uh, break, the fire would lap up to the floor above and, uh, and then penetrate those floors. And it moved as, as uh, we had said, it moved up from the 22nd floor, dropped down to the 21st, and uh, eventually made its way up to the 30th floor, uh, where by that time, uh, uh, the fire department was able to maintain a water supply to the sprinkler system, which was never an issue. Uh, they did, as Glenn said, they were pumping up that standpipe for quite some time before they realized the problems. Uh, and uh, they were having considerable problems in maintaining the water supply to the building because of broken glass that was raining down and literally slicing through the five inch line. And uh, so multiple lines, hose lines were, were broken uh, and they ended up kind of jerry-rigging uh, plywood, uh, essentially like hose ramps or shelters for the supply line ultimately to keep that uh, uh, fire activity, uh, uh, the firefight uh, moving. And they also fought it from you know, with exterior streams from, from exposure buildings. One thing I just would like to quickly um, touch on is uh, Glenn and kind of mentioned the, uh, the PRVs, press restricting valves being an issue in this fire. Um, and we, a lot of times when we look at this fire, that's something that we focus on. Um, but it's also important to think about um, how um, the setup that was used at the time of this fire and the, uh, the existing building code as far as um, standpipe systems, they still probably would have had significant issues. Um, 
pre-1993, the code only required a minimum of 65 PSI at the fire floor. When you're using a 100 PSI automatic nozzle, an inch and a half hose, um, you're already in a you know, world of hurt um, under perfect operating, uh, the intended operating pressures. So I think that's something just to kind of note. And, and uh, so as soon as we talk about this fire, the PRVs is something that comes up in every discussion. Um, and I'm always talking to people like, yes, the PRVs were an issue, but there would have been flow issues. You would have not gotten whatever the um, intended pressure on those nozzles were, even if they were operating uh, properly. Um, and also this fire really highlights um, stuff, uh, one of the, a common thing, a common theme that people talk about with high rise buildings is when you talk about the potential for collapse in high rise buildings, a lot of people aren't too worried about it. And I think the reason why is people, a lot of people associate, I know, um, uh, particularly on the West Coast, uh, people associate high rise buildings with being concrete buildings. Um, and that's just not the case. When you look at, you know, the World Trade Centers, or you look at this building, we're, we're essentially talking about lightweight steel, you know, or steel beams uh, that can be affected by fire really easily. So um, those, you know, this was a great example where, um, where the building can be compromised by the heat and fire and, and uh, we need to be thinking about that stuff. Yeah, I just want to add, add one quick thing here. Um, just to follow up with what uh, James said about the uh, the hose line stretch, um, yes, that is that that's that's one of the big issues here. Of that, back in the day, um, actually, I went to the NFPA conference, which that year was in New Orleans um, after this fire, and it was the same conference, by the way, where NFPA fifteen hundred got shot down uh, as a new standard. That's a whole other story for another day. But uh, but at that conference, a presentation was made. And I'm not sure who did it so long ago now, but uh, this, the NFP actually did a survey of fire, major fire departments across America and asked them what size hose they were using and what's, what type of nozzles they were using. And uh, James, even, it's just going to sh even shock James Johnson here right now. Of their survey, only 3% of the fire departments in the country actually use two and a half inch hose with uh, a smoothbore nozzle, which of course is what the standpipe standard at the time was designed around. It was designed for, for a large diameter hose and a smoothbore nozzle, not automatic nozzles, not fog nozzles, not inch and a half, not inch and three quarter. And it just shows you, and I think the takeaway for me back then was, it shows you what can happen on an NFPA committee, in this case, the NFPA 14 committee, who effectively was asleep at the wheel while this was all going on for, for a long time, not realizing America's fire departments had gotten away from two and a half and went for inch and a quarter, uh, inch and three quarter, inch and a half. Which the arguments, of course, as you all know, were that it's a it's a it's a manpower issue. It's an issue of how many people can put a hose line. But of course, we all agree that the fire doesn't care how many people we have in a hose line. All it cares about is how much water you're throwing at it. So that's a really important point here. Is that um, there was a major disconnect between the size of the hose, the flow of the hose, and the actual system was installed because that was a problem. It was a problem. I even I was working for the San Antonio Fire Department at the time, and um, it really got their attention as well because two and a half has sort of gone the way of the horse and wagon. It was it wasn't a popular size hose anymore. So anyway, I just want to amplify what what, uh, what James said. The, the other just the one other thing here is uh, uh, go ahead, James. You finish up, and I'll jump in. Go ahead. Okay, thanks, Jack. The one last thing I was just going to say is, um, and just for the listeners, and a lot of you are probably already familiar with this, but when I'm looking at a high-rise building, that's the real thing I'm trying to identify is that pre-93, post-93, because that's going to tell us a ton about that stem pipe system um, and as far as what to expect and then what kind of challenges we're going to have to overcome. So um, you don't have to be the biggest building geek in the world, um, but just trying to be able to identify even that like, you know, identify those high rises if you have them in your districts that are the 60s, 70s, 80s, and then those ones that are modern high rises, because uh, they're going to react significantly different. So okay. the other thing here is that with these buildings, you know, big, big uh, gross floor space, this is 22,400 square feet, big space, big hose. The other thing is that, you know, uh, the, this fire started on a vacant area in 22 from construction workers with linseed oil rags. And the other thing is that there was an access stair here. So this fire pushed from 22 down to 21. 
So knowing these things ahead of time does help the firefighters too. And the other thing I picked up on here is they mentioned, it, they, they say center core. This is a center core push to the side. You find this sometimes. Everybody picks up on the center core as being in the middle. This was a, a south side center core. So if you see this, the elevated banks, C, D, and B, all right, it's, it's sitting on the south wall. The, uh, there's a staircase, it looks like it's inside the, that center core, the west, it's off to the left there, Charles. Uh, uh, right there yeah. is, a set, is one staircase. I mean, it's there. Right here, I, yeah. Uh, there's the center stair you went to. Yeah. All right, and on the far right, my right, I don't know about yours, <laughs> is the east stair, a remote stair, think of that. That, that. Those two, there were two stairs in the core and you still had a remote stair. So just a general layout on this. And again, everybody should know each floor layout is different. So this somewhat is a semi-open floor, basically, you know, with all the, the, old, the old school method, everybody had their office uh, on the perimeter wall and, and other workers worked in the middle. But you see that access stair there, uh, right in the middle, out by the electrical room. It's not that far from the center stair either. So just keep in mind the, the, these buildings with these access stairs, they're hidden. All right, unless you know where they are and everything else. And some of these buildings uh, in New York, I, I've seen them in Glenn and Charles, I've seen them run several floors and some, very few do I see enclosed when some that I saw open uh, with uh, what I call uh, water curtain sprinkler systems where the sprinklers are close together. And on each floor they have a baffler. So to capture the smoke, so it doesn't go up and, and, uh, and doesn't allow the smoke detector to go off. So just some hidden little things uh, to take a look at. Uh, the other thing, too, is fire barriers. We, Charles hit on that a little. At that time, there was an absence of uh, dampers in ventilation shafts, you know, both vertical and horizontal. So, again, dealing with the grandfathered stuff, nowadays you won't do that. But that's, that was the code at the time. I, I believe, uh, Glenn, they used Boca back then? Uh, yeah, it was uh, Boca National Building Code. And, well, okay. No, but this was uh, Philadelphia flavored. Yeah, Philadelphia flavor yeah, of yeah. the Boca Nation. And important point, yeah. Charles, you can bring up that this is a unique thing to the city of Boca we love. To this day, um, their building, the, we'll call it, their, actually it's called License and Inspections Department, actually also enforces their fire code as well. Um, the fire department has a more minimal role in fire prevention. Their l &I department, who's in charge of the construction of this building, actually does not only the building code, but the fire code. So uh, this is an issue. Um, I think that one of the takeaways for us is never, never rely on your local building department to do their job properly, because this is a job that the standpipe system apparently was never tested. They certainly never picked up on the fact that these PRVs were all messed up in the standpipe, and they allowed it to continue to the day of the fire. So uh, what James Johnson would say is, and Jack is saying here, is you got to go out there and do do your own inspections, oversee that kind of stuff, have a close connection to the building department, make sure that they're actually doing the job that needs to be done. Thank you. And this building again was built in the same era or vintage as the World Trade Center, the, it was. Uh, this building was built, I believe in the early 70s, or I was started in the late 60s and occupied in the early 70s. And that's roughly what the World Trade Center was, correct, guys? It was about the same, so the same vintage? Yeah, there's a whole bunch of high rises that, as James mentioned, there's one group of them, the pre-93 buildings, or you got that, but you also have the uh, old school, you know, the stuff that came out of that 77, 1977 conference on high rises. You know, sprinklers weren't in that package at the beginning. They came later on. So there's a whole bunch of, existing high rises that were built in that same period that did not get sprinklers. So don't assume that because it's a high rise, it's going to be sprinkled as it wasn't here. We still got a lot in, across the country, of course, that aren't yeah. unlike this building. So yeah. one, of, one of the things that uh, Charles and I, we sit on the high right, NFPA high rise committee is that we rolled out retrofitting uh, existing office buildings and, and uh, residential buildings. But then again, that's up to the locals to, you know, to pick up on that. We, we totally endorsed it and everything else. And this was a key point, uh, you know, with the sprinklers. They, I believe they were, they were starting the sprinklers coming from the top down, guys. It was, it was uh, the hopscotch, the little jack. It was based on tenant uh, turnover, I think, or demand. And so there was 11, 15, and then 30, like 34. 
Yeah, so with an occupied building, when you get a vacant floor, that's the time to do it. So they so, only had uh, seven floors out of 38 were sprinklered. Yeah. According to the report. So, and the below grade floor. So there was a below grade feature, I guess, for parking or whatever, Charles. There was some sort of below grade. Yeah. Over here, but um, those were sprinklered. But uh, yeah, it, only seven floors were, were uh, sprinklered. Uh, Charles, go ahead and uh, keep going with uh, your thoughts. So this just shows the, the fire conditions. Uh, the, this was after the fire, and we talked about the central core being shifted to the side. This is the back of the building, and so that blind, blind wall there is the elevator lobbies and the shafts. Uh, and so this is on the opposite side of the building from, from Philadelphia City Hall. Uh, and then this one you don't see very often. Uh, that is a, uh, the building at the very edges, ends of demolition. Uh, but this at the time um, was, I think it may have been the, the tallest building demolished in the United States. Uh, we've since surpassed that in New York City. I don't know how things are going with the Bankers Trust Jack or whatever is going on over there on Park Avenue. But uh, this was a big deal. And of course, there was uh, all kinds of litigation. The other thing I wanted to point out uh, that I just remembered was this was, you know, this is the middle of downtown and because of the precariousness of that building, uh, that whole square block was basically shut down for months uh, after the fire uh, because of the uh, concerns about uh, structural uh, facade panels falling off. These were stone panels. One of them did cut loose during the fire and fell onto an exposure building. Uh, but again, there was no uh, uh, structural collapse per se, but there was significant structural compromise. And um, Charles, Charles, can you go back to that one photo oh, again? The, just the a couple of things. Yeah, a couple of things about that. No, yeah, the other one, the, oh, the one you just had. Okay. Yeah, just a couple of things. And that's, that's something we don't, we don't think about a lot because once the fire's out, mm -hmm. we leave. But this building is right across from City Hall in Philadelphia. They're effectively, they're, if you've ever been to Philly, it's literally this is like the center of the city they call it center city actually and uh that particular street in front of there was a crucial street to navigate that a whole area part of town so it really did did uh did really mess things up for quite a while as charles pointed out and then one other thing there is you can see there's a red car on the left hand side of that picture just above that uh when this building was finally torn down it's certainly it, it's since been replaced and right above where that red car is, but actually where the footprint of the building was, there is a nice memorial there uh, to the three firefighters that were killed. It's right, yeah, actually where he's got it, uh, that red box there. So there's a bench there with three helmets on it, not unlike the one that was uh, uh, prepared for the Vendome Hotel fire collapse in Boston. Uh, it's very similar to that, but they did in fact recognize the three firefighters there. There's a brand new building there. That's about the only, the only connection to that fire is that memorial that's about it and it's really for the firefighters of course as it should be uh, but there's no other marker or placard or anything else so anyway i just want to point that out well. charles could you go back to the other slide the one with the when you show the whole building all right just just for uh, you know the younger people listening and younger firefighters i mentioned that the uh, the uh, center core was on the side wall that whole area where there are no windows is where this that side center core is you see that that's, that's a read of the building if you want to know where the core is on this one, all right? The, the other thing, uh, Charles, is that the, uh, the building coming down right now is 40 stories being decommissioned in Manhattan, all right? They've taken it down to put up a 70-story one. And our second decommissioned one was where the two firefighters died was the uh, uh, Deutsche Bank after 9-11. One of the, uh, Charles, before uh, we talk about some more of the, uh, the lessons or what you found in your report, um, you tell us what uh, we talked to the, the, the chief or the commissioner at the time. Um, Richmond, I believe, was his last name. Well, yeah, well, it's actually Richmond had, had retired. Bill Richmond, who, who passed away a couple of years back, okay. um, had just retired. But I had the good pleasure of uh, getting to meet him. Um, when I was working at Tri Data, and, and we um, kind of maintained uh, 
you know, contacts. He was a bit of a mentor of mine. Uh, but uh, he was, you know, really instrumental uh, in, in doing our field work. Um, and uh, he maintained an association uh, with the Reagan Heart Center and, and came up uh, shortly, I think in about 2010, and, and did a really a, a fantastic uh, presentation on the MOVE incident, looking at a police fire coordination, which is a whole other uh, story, um, uh, really, uh, that, that, that everybody should hear. Um, but, but yeah, so, so, uh, and Bill Richmond did do a, a management book. It's a, it's a small book, uh, but it's a good book with the, basically his distillation of lessons, but he was very well regarded commissioner in Philadelphia. And, uh, basically as, as it was described to me by Phil Shaneman, uh, was that, you know, he's not the typical guy who would get promoted to commissioner. He had come through, uh, had a, you know, distinguished career but very uh, innovative, very progressive. He had been kind of this, the research and data person uh, for the Philadelphia Fire Department, had been a pioneer in kind of equal employment opportunity and dealing with those issues. And he ended up getting uh, selected as commissioner and, and had a, a very successful uh, uh, reign that's unfortunately was marked by the, uh, you know, the, the move incident, uh, which kind of hung over uh, him and, and still hangs over that city uh, uh, to this day. But, but yeah, so uh, thank you for reminding me about uh, Bill Richmond. Uh, and just to move on here, uh, we talked about the fire alarm. And, and one of the things that we have in the, the US Fire Administration report, which if you Google One Meridian Plaza, it's actually the first thing that comes up. <clears throat> this, this here is from a, a presentation I'd given in the past, but this is at the lobby command station. And this big kind of uh, whatever color that is panel, I guess light brown, that's that didn't even work anymore. That was like an access control system with little sensors for the doors. But uh, obviously, we're in there with no power, so you don't know what's what. This lowly device is the enunciator panel for the uh, fire alarm. And again, keep in mind, uh, this is the pre-digital photography. So uh, I did my best with my 35 millimeter camera, and of course send the, 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 the film off to get developed and it comes back and it's blurry, but you can read it. Um, and essentially what it paraphrasing this uh, is, is basically it says when the alarm sounds, you push this button here that says reset. And then if that doesn't work, uh, you know, you just do that, just keep resetting it and then, you know, have send somebody up to go look at it. So, you know, so if you talk about, you know, building inspection, when you're going out doing inspections, you know, you get a lot of mileage out of just kind of ca casually talking to, you know, the guy, the guy who sits at that desk, and you just kind of lean over and say, hey, um, you know, what do you do when the fire alarm goes off? And he's probably not clever enough to come up with a lie. He'll probably say, oh, I hit the reset button, you know. And so as soon as you hear that, you know you got a problem in that building that you got to lean on, right? And, and we've seen this time and again, but there it was in, in Dymo label tape right on the thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so there you go. But that, that, I don't know that that, because it was blurry, I don't think it met the editorial standards. I don't, it didn't go into the uh, US Fire Administration report, but that, that's a million dollar photograph right there. <laughs> And I'll that, all my uh, that. pictures on that one. I'll, I'll go back to the uh, uh, the building. Charles, what was it like? I guess as a as a for our, our viewers, uh, what was it like when you got the notification to okay, you're going to go to Philadelphia and you're going to do this report. Um, can you think back and 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 whenever we're talking about a line of duty death. Um, and, and, and I've talked to either people of doing the investigation or chiefs that have had a line of duty death. There's always that apprehension. When you went into Philadelphia, how were you received? And, and what was the, the basic overview of what they wanted you to, to look at? And how long was it before, after the fire in February, you went into Philly and, and started the investigation? Uh, well, that's a great uh, great question. Uh, and so the first thing I want to do, as much as I would love not to, uh, I'd love to puff up the, the whole notion of the U.S. FA major fire investigation team, is that, you know, first of all, there's no jumpsuits. Uh, there's no pager. 
there's no klaxon that goes off and you rush out of your house and you know uh, there's no go bag in your trunk. So the fire administration, uh, again, this is not a, a, a statutory uh, responsibility. Well, it is a statutory responsibility. But they do not have the power to go in if they're not wanted. And they are very careful about not doing things uh, that would step on any other reg federal agency's regulatory actions. And so uh, we went with the consent of the Philadelphia Fire Department. Um, as I said, uh, I think that my uh, association with uh, Bill Richmond, the former commissioner, was, was really instrumental. Uh, I got tremendous reception there. Uh, you know, and this was a fairly much earlier on in my career, um, you know, and as you point out, it was a three firefighter fatality incident, the largest high rise fire in the United States at the time. Um, and, and so it was a big deal. Uh, but I can tell you the Philadelphia Fire Department uh, was, was wide open. Um, you know, they were, there were no, you know, nobody pulled me aside and say, hey, you know, make us look good, do this, do that, or do the other. Um, you know, and there were some, there were a lot of issues in this fire. Uh, you know, with inspection, with enforcement, uh, there were some there were some operational issues. Candidly, if you read the report, they're in there. Um, you know, but is this something that couldn't have happened in another jurisdiction? Absolutely, absolutely not. It certainly could. Uh, and so uh, we we go in typically, and I don't know what the time frame is now, but the, you know, we went in probably a couple of weeks after the fire, believe it or not. Um, I guess things hadn't gotten moldy yet. But it was a, a still, I mean, I remember it like it was yesterday. Uh, you know, imagine kind of traipsing through a 38-story abandoned high-rise building with no electricity, fire damage, you know, where three guys had died, you know, and all this, you know, uh, stuff going on. And at the time I was there, there were still uh, structural engineers running around. And I think the recollection I had was that, you know, uh, they, they had the outside perimeter and the streets were still closed, right? There was still, uh, you know, a quarter inch of glass on that whole block in front of the building. So, you know, this was not a sterile scene by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I'm just going to look through here at some of these photographs. Uh, to show you. Charles? Yeah. Uh, on the picture oh. of the shooting the hose strings from the other buildings. Yeah. All right. Were there any issues? I assume they came off the standpipes there. Were any issues there with the BRV valve? No. No, they were able to get, uh, as you see, you know, now how effective the streams were again. Yeah. You're doing your best to cross a, a pretty big avenue in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. uh, but as you see, they were not going to be uh, definitive in putting this fire out, right? So yeah. as you see here, you know, this fire essentially burned, you know, 22nd floor up to the 30th floor. And I'm going to try, and, and for whatever reason, this is a, I guess the economies, if you think back, I know it's hard to believe pre-digital photography. I have a photograph, which I've never been able to get uh, since. Uh, and I think we took slides in those days uh, and then they had them converted to put in and then you made them a, a half tone to put into the report. Um, but the, uh, I think they said it was 10 sprinkler heads operated on the 30th floor and stopped that fire. And you could walk into an office on the 30th floor. Now, keep in mind, you're walking across the floor and you'll see the picture. It was undulating, okay? It was because of the sagging of the uh, uh, beams, so steel beams, the, and the floor slab had cracked, but you could walk onto a desk. You'd look a couple feet over, the cheap glass window uh, may have been broken from fire exposure, but there was a piece of paper sooted on that desk, but you could read it, okay? And then as you go down into that building, uh, there's the, just shows you how the building was situated in the city hall. Uh, and there's a couple of YouTube videos on this, but unfortunately they don't really, they're not time uh, coordinated with the, the images and the uh, what's going on. We talk about structural damage. There was, uh, this is the area where some of these panels were getting loose one of them did come off and fall. I think we have, yeah, there it is. So obviously you don't want to be standing there. That's the Gerard building The uh, that actually had uh, members fighting from that, but there was a cross through on one of the lower floors. Uh, and so this was at, I think the, uh, I don't know, high teens, I think for that was. Now, if you could elaborate a little bit now, they fought this fire 
I don't know, the fire came in around eight o'clock on a Saturday night or whatever. They fought this fire through the night. They didn't back out of this in an hour or two. They backed out after they were fighting this fire for hours. I, I think the report said like 11 hours. They fought this fire. Yes. Do any of you want to share? I, I'm, uh, I'm curious as to, because again, this is 1991. What, was there any, you know, the, the, was it the, the reconnaissance obviously from interior or, you know, we, you, you just in the nineties or any time, you know, before the world trade center collapsed, you really didn't think about it collapsing. The command in Philadelphia, and he backed out. Obviously that was the case, but what, what led to 11 hours? What, what was in that 11 hours that all of a sudden, you know, okay, 11 hours, boy, now we got to get the heck out of here and back out. Can you elaborate a little bit those hours that elapsed and what was maybe transpiring in the command officer's heads? I believe reading that somewhere around the fifth or sixth hour, they actually had a structural engineer come into the building while firefighting efforts were still underway. And I think they got up to the 20 something floor. Maybe, I forget which one it said. Um, and that, and basically that was the engineer that said that there was going to be um, significant issues or the chance of collapse. I remember reading that somewhere. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, this was a kind of a classic um, at the risk of dating myself, I guess, an old school firefight, which is you go to work and, and you just don't stop working until the fire's out, you know. Right. Uh, but, but yes, there was a tremendous uh, sense of psychological investment in this building, right? Uh, and, and, and you can imagine, you know, just the, the physical, you've lost three members, uh, you've rescued, I mean, this was a saga, right? I mean, these guys went up, they got in trouble, they found them, they did the removal. The fire still went on. That wasn't the end of the incident. They were right. still fighting this fire, right? The five inch hand lay up the stairwell. Uh, so this was a major uh, a battle. This is just showing from uh, on the 30th floor where you had fire penetrating through uh, the floor slab um, and starting a, a fire. Now this is an interesting issue and I didn't even think, I don't even remember now, that at the time, of course, it was 1991, and I'm looking at these pictures thinking about asbestos. And of course, I, I wasn't wearing any damn respirator, neither was anybody else. Um, but there were law firms, and you can imagine the expense. Uh, and this is pre-91, you know, right? So there's no Dropbox, right? Uh, there's files and files and files. And they ended up having to set up like a clean, dirty partition and take dirty files, copy them, and the clean paper would come out to get those records out of the building. Uh, but you can see here, the, you know, the fire extended up. This is on the 30th floor. This was all the sprinkler held it uh, at this point. Uh, I think there's, yeah, there's a, a photograph showing a crack in the floor slab, uh, which again, you just don't see this in high rise building fires. Um, and, uh, and then you keep going on that. Sorry, going the wrong direction. Uh, and this is yeah, that's this, the one, Charles. And yeah, this is it. this is just pick your floor. This is go 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. Like Sparrow Agnew said about ghettos, you've seen one, you've seen them all. Uh, that's what this building was looking like, right? And so you know you're going to bang your head on the on the on the damn uh, uh, structural steel. Right, it's deflected that much, and this was complete burnout, right? And this is uh, metal furniture, and you should see there's nothing there. You could see uh, you'd walk where there used to be a corridor, uh, and the only way you would know there was a door, there would literally be a pile of ash and the door hardware laying on the floor, uh, and that's how you knew there was a door. Uh, and everything else was pretty much unrecognizable. Everything that was wood. Was was ashes on those floors? Completely. Charles, did did you see any any uh, impact to the vertical columns, too, in a way of it twisting or? No, I did not uh, document any uh, significant uh, deformations on verticals. Uh, but these, you know, obviously the 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 floor uh, beams and, and this was a you know a, a steel floor pan poured concrete over these uh, steel. 
uh, but you see the, the, the condition they were in. Uh, there's some more pictures in here. Yeah, there's another one. Wow. And as you can see, there's a pretty good fire load right on these, right? This is back, like I said, a lot of paper in these offices. So, so as we kind of wrap things up here, is Charles, let's let's go back and hit and and anybody here on our panel the lessons that I think the lessons here for me anyway is that you have to get to know obviously your buildings and understand what you have as far as protection systems inside. Um, I'll go around here and, and hit one at each one of you, what you would like to, you know, what you feel are the lessons and we'll have Charles uh, have the final, what he would like to get out. So James, what do, you, what do you think were the lessons that you would like to convey to a young firefighter in a city who has these, these buildings? Yeah, I think for me, the biggest things that I took away and I've used this a lot for some of the high rise stuff I've done is really the standpipe issues and just, understanding what the, the codes of the day or whatever the codes of the building are, and then what are the, um, the newer codes and just making sure that we're set up for that and we understand it. Um, also being able to understand PRVs, being able to recognize them, I think is very important. I think there's a lot of kind of takeaways just from that, um, that I think, especially if you have high rise buildings that are, that are essential. If you're a city that has high rise buildings, this is, this is a fire that, um, that uh, definitely should study and, and take lessons away from, for sure. Paul, any thoughts? Sure, Chief. Uh, the systems, building systems, pre-planning, um, understanding the systems, whether it be sprinkler, fire pump, standpipe, understanding the system's capabilities and limitations. Um, you know, our jurisdiction, we have literally a handful of high-rise buildings, and they're all sprinkler, all fire pump, all standpipe. Um, and, and it kind of scares me. I know how often a, a floor or part of a floor is out of service for renovation. My fear is Murphy's going to visit us one day when that system's off. Not you, Jack, the other Murphy. He's, he's on the call. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and you know what? I think to some degree, we get lulled into a false sense of security with the buildings being sprinklered that, you know, you're not going to have a major incident there. And um, I think, you know, small fire departments, whether it be career volunteer that, that don't have a hot, lot of high rise buildings need to be prepared for that. It's a little bit of a double edged sword. Uh, our experiences, we don't go to those buildings a whole lot, which is a good thing. Um, the the uh, detriment to not going there a whole lot is you don't understand the buildings that, that, that much. You don't get into them and uh, get through them. You know, you may have a uh, crew on the rig that's never been in the building before. Um, so training, pre-planning, uh, knowing the systems, maintenance, you know, to give it a little bit of a code plug, you know, the code officials had to pay attention to these buildings. Uh, there's a requirement in, in uh, NFPA 25 for a weekly run test, which was changed some additions ago to a monthly flow test or monthly uh, fire pump run, as long as they do a, a risk analysis. So one of the building engineers brought this to my attention and I gave him this analogy is they wanted to go from weekly to a monthly. I said, you know, where, wherever you live, I'm, I'm sure that uh, your fire department has a, a fire pumper that has a diesel motor in it. I said, how would you feel if they only started that fire pumper once a month and it was supposed to go to your house that's on fire? And the guy just looked at me like, uh, okay, I kind of get it. Um, so there's, a, there's so much in play in these buildings, you know, as was pointed out, you know, there's so many things that can go wrong and, and we, we need to be prepared for that from many different perspectives, training, pre-planning, code enforcement. It's a- uh, Glenn, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I just uh, just echo what uh, uh, Paul and uh, James has just identified. I mean, it's training, knowing your buildings, understanding, um, um, again, how they work, how they don't work, connecting, for example, uh, your operations to that system, that standpipe system. Will your hose be able to supply the kind of water to put out the fire that you need given the system you have in there? So there's a lot there. I want to just add one other point. I think that's important that uh, uh, to put this in perspective, this, this report that Charles uh, Gordon and uh, Mark Chubb put together um, was, a, I would say, at the sort of mid to tail end of the golden era of fire inquiries here in America. 
Yeah, at one time, um, you know, we actually used to do the U.S. Fire Administration did, in fact, investigate fires. One of the first ones they did was the Beverly Hills Supper Club in 1977. Tom Clem, uh, had, it was his first fire that he did. He ended up working at the NFPA years later. There was a time in our history where we did national inquiries into significant events. So at that time, the 70s, it was the NFPA and the USFA. As time went on, you see here the report that Charles helped prepare. Uh, this was a contracted out project of the USFA. It wasn't even USFA itself doing it, it was contracted out to try data. And since then, really, this is about the time at which things really started to change. We're not doing national fire inquiries anymore. So we, you know, of course, we had NIST do the World Trade Center and a couple other incidents, but we do not have the regularity of investigations into major incidents in this country. Think about what happened in Oakland, California at, the, at that warehouse or other fires that we've had over the years where there really is no report. And it's a really, it's a really, it's a big shame because um, I'm sure the USFA and the NFPA both stopped doing them because it's expensive to do it. And we're, we're, the, we're the lessers because of that, because I can't tell you, you go out, if you look for Charles's report on the Meridian Plaza fire, it's still on USFA's website, okay? It's still there. Um, you know, the 93 bombing, the World Trade Center, that may have been the last one they did. And ironically, that was Fire Engineering's magazine's own review of that incident. It wasn't even contracted out. They just simply re reprinted Fire Engineering's 1993 bombing issue. So we're missing something dramatic here. We're not doing inquiries into major incidents in this country. And like I said, we're all losers because of that. We don't know what happened. I mean, the fact, look at the level of detail that Charles and the folks here on the call talked about today. We only know that because we went and looked at, at the fire afterwards. So if the, you know, if something we can do to sort of get that back with the US Fire Administration on the front burner again to start doing these reports, they're really, really important. So anyway, that's what I wanted to say. So. Jack, go ahead. Jack Murphy. You're muted. You're muted. You're muted. All Jack. right. There, oh, there we go. There you go. All right. Uh, one of the things that I, I took away from this, and, and, and Charles showed it, the very little thing, the little things getting you in trouble. When you walk into a building and you look at a fire alarm panel or something, and you see labels on the panel, that's a hint. That didn't come with the, uh, the fire alarm company or nobody. These are all the mistakes they made and trying to answer these alarms over time. And again, you have different people coming in and out of there manning that desk. One of the things we're doing with the uh, working on uh, is uh, NFPA, we're coming out with a new standard on fire and life safety directors in certain buildings, high rises being one of them, that you have a dedicated person there in those buildings. These buildings need that type of dedicated person with a background, a good background. You know, one of the things I always tell the, the classes in school, there's no law out there that says a building has to have a security. It's only there for perceived threats. The fire is a perceived threat. We have nobody there watching that closely. Uh, the thing with companies, companies got to get out and get into these buildings, they do their recon. The recon is for you. What are the safety and precautions for you in response to this building. What, the other thing I picked up on this building is that the electrical components went out on the generator, yet it was fed by gas. Usually it's, it's diesel, but that was a gas thing there. They couldn't bypass that somehow. So some of these things, if you know ahead of time, adds you for the intelligence on the building and the response. And I, I'm pretty sure nobody picked up on that access there for quite a while, all right? So again, the fire, most of the fire trials, I assume, went up rather than down a little bit, but still there's another, there's another entry point. You know, if you can, you get two deuce and ass in there and, and work off that. So the other thing too is that this was unique. You're not seeing these remote staircases anymore. That west stair is remote, all right? Basically, it's 420 feet. If they don't put in these certain elevators, they have to put a remote staircase outside of the, uh, outside of the core. And they, in the core today, the Don stairs are scissors, basically. You're confined. You're basically in one spot. I don't care what side you come out on. It's right in the, in the same area. You're not that coming from a distance that you can do a flank, flank position too. So take a look at those things. The more you know about the building, the safer you are. Thank you, guys. 
Charles, your final thoughts, and, and this is your, you know, again, Juan, thank you. It's, it's, um, it's wonderful to be able to have an author of, of a report um, to actually, you know, you hear firsthand from their, from their mouth what, what they saw and what they thought. Um, well, well, thank you for that. Uh, and, you know, look, I, I'm, I'm happy, uh, delighted to be a witness, uh, you know, to pass this along as it were, uh, not that is that, cap, is that copyrighted, uh, to make sure that, you know, members need to know this, right? It, it, everybody starts out, you know, you're the, you're the bright, interested young guy reading the books. Uh, you got to get out of the firehouse, like Jack said. You know, these are your buildings. You know, the architect, the engineer, they're not going to die in the building, okay? You're the one who's going to die in that building. So it behooves you to get out and look at it and to understand how it's going to work. And I don't care who you are, whether you're Philadelphia or New York or Los Angeles or White Plains, uh, if you think you're going to put out a well-developed fire in an open plan, high-rise office building, uh, good luck to you. Uh, you better hope every single component and system in that building is working well uh, and you're still going to have your hands full. And we knew this, as, as Jack pointed out, I think we talked about maybe, maybe before we got online, you know, John O'Hagan, uh, high rise fire and life safety, uh, kind of the standard book. I'd love to see fire engineering put it back into press. Um, but we'll have another one coming out soon. But the, you know, if you cannot put out with manual fire suppression, right? Uh, O'Hagan said, was it 5,000 square feet, Jack? Or was it 2,500? 2,500. And then the code people said, well, let's compromise. We'll, we'll do 5,000. Well, that hasn't changed. That was the late 70s, right? Uh, and we're the same. We're all the same. Right. And so uh, it's not magic. And so you got to get out there. You got to take ownership of these buildings, understand what you're up against and be able to make those hard calls uh, early on in the incident. So um, that's really all I have to say. Other than, and, and to echo Jack's point also is that the code should require for a building of this size uh, that the staff are competent uh, and know what the heck is going on in that building. But again, um, and that's still uh, aside from a, a several large cities. Uh, you know, it's not it's still very uncommon in the U.S. Um, gentlemen, thank you. Here is that book. Oh. Uh, it's backwards, whatever. You'll see it on there. But this was a, a book that's no longer in print, but you can find it. It's uh, from uh, John uh, T. O'Hagan, who used to be the fire commissioner in New York City. Um, he fought pretty hard for uh, life safety and... Um, high-rise pre-planning and, and life safety uh, for New York um, was instrumental. He, in, in reading about him, he was really against what they were doing in the uh, World Trade Center when they were building the building. He was, he, he, he knew that they, that was going to be a, a problematic building. So um, for younger members that are out there even some older members who don't know uh, about this book or John T. O'Hagan's legacy and what he did, did for the fire service, uh, you'd be wise to, uh, to Google and, and search him out. Um, I mentioned the three firefighters who lost their lives. We, we mentioned them uh, throughout, but uh, this was really in their honor 30 years ago. It's a, it's a long time, but uh, their memory should always be with the, the fire service and all of us as uh, Captain David P. Holcomb. Uh, he was 52 years old. Um, firefighter Phyllis McAllister, she was 43. And firefighter James Chappelle, I believe is how you say his last name. Uh, he was 29. So, um, you know, they and, their and lives. And Joe, Joe sorry to interrupt, but Phyllis was actually a man. Phyllis, okay, I apologize. No, no, that's uh, it's a little long. <laughs> but unless you should see the picture. That, that. Yeah, okay. Um, but they gave their lives, uh, you know, in trying to battle this fire. Which think about it. We talked about five-inch hose laying, laying five-inch hose in the dark, in the dark. They, they, there, there was no backup systems, no power. They were, they were doing all their work in the dark, and also they probably didn't have all the fancy LED lighting that you know you, you go see on everybody's heads or flashlights now or LED. This was 1991. They probably still had those giant ever ready lanterns on yeah. you know, 
that you saw on, on fire apparatus when we all started in the job. So um, we will have a link to the um, report uh, and uh, we wanna thank everybody for, for tuning in and uh, be safe everybody. But Charles, thank you again for, uh, for joining us and uh, the rest of the panel, thank you. Thank you.